Today's chilling story of the icebox killer, which brings the term cold case to a whole new level. We will be covering the disappearance of Denise Huber, an innocent 23-year-old who never came home after a fun night out with friends. This story begins on June 3, 1991 in Los Angeles. Denise Huber had just attended a concert into the early hours of the morning. She'd agreed to drive her friend home to Orange County after the concert. After dropping off her friend, Denise started to make her way home. Denise's parents grew concerned because Denise's bed was empty and her car was missing from the driveway. Denise's parents decided to phone the police. All of her friends instantly helped look for her. They tried retracing Denise's steps by driving the same way that she would have driven home the night of the concert. Upon doing this, Tammy Brown, her closest friend, found Denise's car on the shoulder of the freeway. The car had a flat tire and a dead battery. There were skid marks showing that Denise's tire must have blown while driving. Her keys and purse were not in there, and there was no blood or signs of violence. The local police department and the Orange County Sheriff's Department joined forces to conduct a search and investigation on Denise's disappearance. They placed a billboard sign close to where her car was found, with her photo and a phone number in case anyone had seen her. Local television stations also pitched in, covering the case's updates and sharing her photo. Eventually, as time went on, the case was put on the back burner. It had been three years without any sightings of Denise. On July 9th, 1994, Elaine Canalia and Jack Court were selling items at a swap meet in Prescott Valley, Arizona. The two of them owned a paint distribution company, which sparked the interest of a contractor named John Famolaro. Femilaro told them about how he had painting supplies left over from his contractor jobs to offer them. They left the swap meet and followed John to his home. John's home was in a nice neighborhood and Elaine and Jack were impressed. However, they were taken aback when they got to John's backyard. The couple noticed a rental truck covered completely by a giant tarp. It all felt very out of place. And even though they had just met John, they both clocked that he was acting odd and frantic. Both had a strange feeling about John's behavior and the rental truck in the driveway. The tarp was covering the truck, except for the license plate, which read Maine, not Arizona. Elaine quickly scribbled down the license plate number before driving off. The couple had a friend named Steve Gregory, who was a police detective. Elaine told Steve about the truck and the license plate, and he got in contact with the rental company. Turns out, the truck was stolen six months ago, but it wasn't from Maine. It was from Southern California, the Los Angeles area to be exact. Steve passed this information immediately to the county sheriff in Arizona, who worked in the unit of Dewey, Arizona, where John lived. A few days later, on the morning of July 13th, police found the truck parked in the driveway, just as Elaine and Jack had explained. However, they noticed something very strange. They found an electrical cord that ran from the back of the truck towards the house across the street. But then they saw more electrical wires and extension cords that were running around the house and they grew suspicious. So they sent detectives with a search warrant and a locksmith. Police first searched the truck because they noticed there was a cord running from the truck to the house. Inside, they found a huge freezer with a switch turned to the on position. The freezer was locked and wrapped in masking tape. One detective bravely stuck his arm inside the freezer to see what was inside and lifted up a human arm. There was a human body inside the freezer. The homicide department officials were called to take a look. The lieutenant of the police department stopped the on-site investigation and had the truck and freezer taken to the Arizona State Crime Lab. Police were on standby at John's home, hoping to catch him returning after work. He arrived at about 5.30 p.m. with his mother and he was arrested immediately. Police learned that John had moved into his house two years prior with his brother-in-law, while his mother lived across the street. His contractor's license had been revoked for poor quality work and not paying his employees. All of the statements from John's neighbors were similar. He was an unfriendly, reclusive man who avoided any human interaction. The victim was female. 
Her eyes and mouth were taped shut, and there was a rag stuck in her mouth, used as a gag. Samples of other bodily fluids determined that this woman was forced into unconsented intimacy. After fingerprint samples were taken, a shocking discovery was found. The search for Denise Huber would be over. Unfortunately, she was in fact the victim of this terrible fate. The search inside John's house uncovered piles of newspaper clippings about Denise Huber over the years on both his desk and in the bedroom. They found countless items stained crimson. Things like women's underwear, a size small jacket, a dress with a ripped shoulder, and a checkbook with Denise's name on it. If that wasn't creepy enough, officers also found possessions that did not have any traces of Denise's DNA. It was found that most of these women were still alive and safe. They had never interacted with John or had any suspicions about someone watching them. Unfortunately, more items were found that could not be traced back to anyone. This means there were potentially other victims who perished in the hands of John and whose identities would forever be a mystery. A receipt was found for the freezer that held Denise's body. It was to be delivered nine days before Denise's disappearance. The address it was shipped to was in Laguna Hills, California. This was not a home, but a storage unit. He was conducting business out of that unit while also living in it. When police located the unit, they found a bed and desk and samples of Denise's DNA on the floor and drywall. Information gathered showing that John didn't know Denise. The background of John was no different than any other criminal you read about. His childhood was dark and unsafe, his relationship with his mother was estranged, and there were instances of John acting out towards his past girlfriends. He had apparently handcuffed a number of them, forcing himself on them, and then leaving them exposed and alone, chained to the bed for hours at a time. Uniforms were found in John's possession, and it's thought that he dressed up as an officer to get women to talk to him before luring them into his vehicle. The night he convinced Denise to let him give her a ride home, her alcohol blood content was over 0.8%. She was in fact legally intoxicated. This might have hindered her ability to see that John was dressed as a police officer, but was not in a police car. In July of 1994, John went to trial and pleaded not guilty to the case of Denise Huber. But on September 6, 1997, he was convicted of kidnapping and slaying Denise and was sentenced to death. However, it is reported that he is still alive today, awaiting his execution in the San Quentin State Prison, located in California. This is because the death penalty in the state of California is still under trial, so he may spend the rest of his life behind bars. This has been another episode of Killer Bites. My name is Brandy. Thanks for watching. See you next time.